In this video, we're going to use the Miller-Robin primality test to generate large random primes of a specified bit length. So we're going to use the following algorithm to achieve this. If we're given a positive integer b, that'll represent the number of bits. I recall that a positive integer n is represented with b bits in binary if n lies between 2 to the b minus 1 and 2 to the b. So generate, the way we're going to create a number in this way is to generate a random list of bits between zero, uh, all of them will be 0 and 1. It'll represent a binary expansion of an integer. We're going to place the first and the last digit to be 1. The reason we put the first digit to be 1 is so that we indeed have b bits. The last digit is 1 to make the number odd. We are searching for prime numbers, so we want to only take odd numbers. And then the rest of the bits can be randomly filled in. And this is how we're going to generate a random odd number with the correct number of bits. Then we'll apply the Miller-Rabin primality test to n to see if it's a probable prime. And we'll talk more about that in the video. If we found a prime, we're done. If not, we're going to just repeat the process. So it's not a sophisticated algorithm. Basically, we're choosing a random odd number with the correct number of bits. And then we're using a powerful primality test to see if it's composite or prime. If it's composite, we have to guess again. If it's prime, we give that as the output. All right, and then we'll end the video by talking a bit about the reasonableness of just keeping on guessing like this. Uh, how long will it take? And is it a, an algorithm that we can expect to terminate in a reasonable amount of time? So a key component of this algorithm is the Miller-Rabin primality test. And in this video, we're not going to give any details of this. Let's just treat it as a black box. Let's understand what it gives us. So we're given a positive integer n, and we would like to know if n is prime or not. In other words, if it, is it prime or is it composite? Miller-Rabin test, the way we are going to code it in Python, if we get a true response, then it's kind of weird. It kind of means it's probably true that the number we're dealing with is prime. But if we get a false response, then it's false that the number is prime. In other words, it's composite. So it's a little bit weird. If we get a true, then the number we're dealing with is probably prime. If we get a false, the number we're dealing with is composite. That's the way it's going to work. In a rare case, we get a wrong answer. That's we get an indication that the number is prime, which is a true value in response to the function. But it's actually composite. We won't deal with that in this little video, but just be aware it exists, but it's rare. We'll basically trust the function. If miller rabin gives it true, we will assume it's prime. So why don't we start just by opening a Python environment of your choice. I'll just use an online service. And let's try to find some code to implement the miller rabin test in Python. We won't talk about that theorem in this video, but just look at it as a black box for now. And here's a code that'll work for us. Let's copy and paste it into our environment. Now let's just uh, clean it up a little bit. Let's get rid of these ugly comments. Notice that in the comment it says we should use 40 rounds for K as an optimal value. So we'll, re we'll remember that. And there's just a few little things that we need to clean up here. I think X range is no longer in Python 3. I think that's a Python 2 thing. So we'll get rid of that. And we need to import random. And there's another X range here. Notice the, notice the underscore in the for loop there. The reason for that is because it indicates that the variable doesn't matter. 
the four variable doesn't matter there. We just want to cycle. We want to do a loop of that many times, r minus one, and the variable doesn't matter. So I just wanted to explain that. And also notice in this code here, there's a for else construct in Python there. So that's maybe, it just means if the for loop breaks, the else won't be executed. But like I said, we're not going to talk about why this code works here. Just know that um, if the function returns true, that means it's true. Well, it really means it's probably true that you have a prime. And if it returns false, that means it's false that it's a prime, which is another way of saying it's composite. So now that we understand, but for this video, the if, an, if the Miller-Rabin test confirms that it's uh, prime or says that it's prime, we'll assume that it is. So for us, large prime numbers really mean large probable prime numbers. Here. So let's just test our, our code here. If we take the number 17, 17 is prime, and we take 40 rounds of the test, well, if we uh, apply Miller-Rabin test to those values of n and k, what do we get back when we run it? We get true. So uh, 17 is probably prime. That's what it says. It's actually, that true doesn't mean it's guaranteed to be prime. What if we take 51, which we know is composite? We get false. Yeah, we can count on that, though. A false is, uh, means, it's prime. It means it's composite, and we can guarantee that that's true. And just for a test, uh, why don't we take a random prime? We'll go to this website here, and instead of our little small 17, let's put in this number and run it. And we get true. So it's probably true that's prime, at least according to this test. According to the website, it definitely is prime. Notice if we change it to 9, though. Originally, it was 7 at the end, and if we change it to 9 at the end, that means we're adding 2 to that prime number, right? And although it's certainly possible that P and P plus 2 are both prime, that would be an example of a pair of twin primes, it's most likely the case if N is prime, then N plus 2 is not going to be prime. And we see that here. When we boosted it up by 2 so that the last digit was a 9, we, the Miller-Rabin test is giving back false, and that means that number there is guaranteed to be composite. So let's try to implement some of these ideas Let's take, let's make a function that generates a random odd number with a specified number of bits. So let's define B to be an array or a list of the correct number of bits. We write B0 equal to one. That guarantees that our final list will have the correct, uh, uh, will have a leading one so that it is truly the correct size. We'll put B minus one to be one, which means the very last element of our list will be a one, which indicates that it's an odd number. And then for the other bits, we'll just take random values and between zero and one. And then that list of bits is represents a binary expansion of some integer. And why don't we write another quick little function to take that list of bits and change it into an integer. And it's basically adding up powers of two wherever there's a binary digit of one. So let's call a, let's make a function called binary digits to integer, which takes as its input a list of zero and ones. And our goal is to change that into a base 10 decimal integer. And then just to finish that function return odd value, what, what are we going to return? the conversion of b capital b to an integer using the function we're writing right now so let's take n to be zero and the, power, the first power of two is one and we'll just work through the digits backwards starting at the rightmost entry which is the last entry of the list and then moving our way down towards the front of the list and basically every time we just add on a power of two if there's a one there and we just indicate that by this code here. I hope that's clear. And so what that does is changes our list of zeros and ones into an actual integer we can, we can work with and test with the Miller-Rabin test. So why don't we try to test this by printing out some random odd values with four bits to them. You know, four-bit numbers lie between 8 and 15, 
and we're only taking the odd ones and we see all the odd numbers are appearing there between 8 and 15. So I think that works. So let's get rid of that and now let's get on to writing our main function which is to generate arbitrarily large random probable primes with a specified number of bits. So let's call our function generate probable prime and we'll take as an input the number of bits we want our prime to be. And really it's uh, not too, not it's pretty easy. We're just going to generate a random odd number. We're going to test if it's prime using the Miller-Rabin test. If it is, we're done. We found it. We found one and we'll return it. If it's not prime, then we'll just repeat it again, generate another random list of bits, test it and see if it's prime and keep doing that. Now it's a very valid question to think maybe this uh, while loop will just go on and on for a long, long time and uh, we'll never exit it in a reasonable amount of time, but we'll see that that actually doesn't happen. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the video. All right, so there's our code and why don't we test it? Let's generate a small prime with four bits. We saw what those numbers were. 11, yeah, that works. And if we try again, 13, so that seems to work. If we boost it up maybe to 20 bits, we get a prime. Hopefully it's a prime, probably a prime. Now, kind of the, in my back of my mind, uh, I want to do some examples of primes that are of the size of RSA primes. And if you're doing 1024 bit RSA, N is going to be 1024 bits. And since N is P times Q, each prime P and Q will be around 512 bits. So let's uh, see what, what is a prime that's 512 bits look like? How big is it? So let's try to generate one. And look at that. So here we go. We have a prime that's uh, very big. Now it's a probable prime, right? Why don't we copy it and go to that website? There's a little section on that website for primality test. Let's paste in our number and see if that website says that the number we made is prime. And it looks like it does. So we've solved the problem that we set out to do at the beginning. We found a way to generate large prime numbers. Now, there is a, some more things we could talk about. When we, how do we know that that while loop is going to end? Like it might, if we're taking such massive numbers as this, we might very well think that there'd be huge, huge gaps with no primes. And that while loop would just be generating many, many numbers, which are not prime. And we'd be waiting there forever. So let's investigate this question a little bit more. Now I'd like to take another approach to this. Let's write another function to generate a random odd number. And instead of being fancy, making a list of a binary list of digits and then converting it to an integer, why don't we just use a system function random and we'll generate a random number between uh, two to the power of B minus one and two to the power of B minus one. That's, that'll give us a random number between in the proper range of bits. So right now N is definitely has the right number of bits. The only problem is it might be even. So if N is even, let's just in increment it by one. And that way we're guaranteed to be returning a random odd number. That's just another way of doing what we did above just a little, with a system function instead. Now, um, just to test this, let's make sure it works. Why don't we write the same little test as we did before, which is try to generate for, let's try to generate 20 random odd values with four bits each. And that's working the same as we saw before. So the idea that I want to implement now is instead of generating an odd number, testing if it's prime, and if it fails, then just generating a brand new odd number. That's the way we did it before, right? This time we're going to generate an odd number using the function we just wrote. But then if it fails the test, and most likely it will fail the test, at least the first one that we choose, 
we're gonna, we're going to just go up by by two then to the next odd number and test that one and then go up by two again so instead of generating a brand new odd number every time we're going to generate one odd number plant our stake there and then go up by two after that and until we hit a prime number okay and when we do this it makes the question of gaps in the prime numbers um, come to our minds because when we st make a starting point by choosing a random odd number, then we have a journey ahead of us. We have to keep going by two, going up by two every time until we get to a prime number. Now remember, we're this value is going to be a massive number. And we may very well expect that it's going to take a very long time until we discover a prime, right? But the amazing thing is it actually doesn't take that long at all. So when we run this, it seems to go very quickly, just like before. What we should do maybe to understand this better is ask ourselves, how many steps does it take? How many iterations does this while loop go for when we calculate such a large prime number? And notice, like, when we test this prime that we just generated, um, it's in that website we see that, yes, that is a prime number, so everything is still working good. After we choose a random odd number as a starting point, how many iterations of adding two do we have to go until we actually hit a prime number? It's actually quite amazing. You, I, my intuitive, I would think it would be the th in the thousands, maybe in the tens of thousands, gaps of that length. But as we see here, the gaps are actually pretty small relative to how large of numbers we're dealing with here. So let's try. We've made a little code here where we just increment a step variable every time. And this time we don't actually print out the prime, we print out the number of steps. We see that it's like 100 steps, 200 steps, but uh, it's not in the thousands of steps. These gaps are only uh, 200, 300 long. And now remember, we're just going by odd numbers. So if we include the even numbers, maybe these gaps are between 400 and 500, 600, right? Not very big compared to the number size of numbers we're using. So I just wanted to make that point. If we calculate several of them, we can kind of get a flavor for the range of numbers that the range of the gap sizes we're dealing with here. So 250, there's a one, uh, 300, that's our biggest one so far, 500, but none of them are in the thousands or tenths of thousands. So I find this very interesting that the gap sizes of the primes are so small. So let's take a look at this function prime distribution stats. What it's going to do is to call random odd gap length many times. The number of times is specified by the number of samples. It will record all of the results, all of the gap lengths, and then just average them to see what the average is when we take many different samples. I'd like to refer to the book by Parr and Pelzel, Understanding Cryptography. It's a great book. I want to look at page 188 and these two highlighted passages here. So if we're given an odd number, P tilde, and we're curious the probability that it's prime, there's a little formula here in the top box. The probability that that odd number is prime is two over the natural log of P. And let's apply this formula in the next highlighted section. So in the example 7.7 .7 here, this is what I want to get to mainly that when we take a modulus that's 1024 bits and we have the associated primes p and q to that modulus each of those primes are going to be around 2 to the power of 512 in other words they're each around 512 bits and when we do our algorithm there and we take a random odd number in order to search for candidates for these primes p and q and we start off by generating a random odd number. How many jumps are we going to have to do? And according to this, it's around 177. That's the probability there. If we plug in 2 to the 512 in that formula up there, we get 2 over the natural log of 2 to the 512, which simplifies, and it's approximately 1 over 177. 
So we would like to test if uh, we can verify that this is true for these size of numbers. And that's what our goal is for the next little part of this video. So let's run this with 100 samples, see what we get. So I'll just repeat once more. It chooses an odd number. It tests if that odd number is prime. If it's not, which is likely, it'll go up by two and check the next odd number if it's prime and then go up by two again. And it'll keep doing this until it hits a prime and it will have to eventually hit a prime. And then every time we go up by two, the gap in gap counter is incremented by one. And that determines a, a gap of odd numbers with no primes in it. And for such a large number as two to the power of 512, it's surprising that the prime numbers are so dense that we can only expect around 200 consecutive odd numbers in a row that aren't prime before we hit another prime. So that kind of shows the primes are occurring quite often and they're not as rare as you'd think. So we get 162, 163, very close, right? To 177, which is what we saw in the, in the textbook there, right? All right, so I'm very happy with that result, and I think we'll end the video here. Thanks for watching.